From Corolla One Studios in Glendale, California, this is the Adam Corolla Show. Adam's guest today, Andrew McCarthy. With Gina Grad on news, Paul Bryan on sound effects, and a round of made up movie. And now, he lost his shirt and Dogecoin today. Actually, he has no idea what the fuck that is. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. No choice but again. A mandate. Get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. We love that about you, right, Gina Grant? That's all right. Handball, Brian. The only thing gay about me is my love for cock. <laughs> Words to we live by. will uh, do a little made-up movie. I got another Bertram clip from way back to play you guys as well. Brian's got an update on uh, Brothers Brother Loves Traveling Show. Oh, yeah. Neil Diamond update. I owe you a minor apology because listening to that song, I'm like, I don't think I've ever heard this song. I'm not sure that I even know this song. Uh, a couple listeners reached out and said, you do know that song because it was featured prominently in the trailer for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Which yeah. we've all seen, of course. Mm-hmm. And we love. Embarrass yourself like that in front of all those goddamn people. All right, what's the matter, partner? It's official, old buddy. And it has been. Gotta love this movie. I do, too. I'm so glad you came around on it. I watched it a second time. I watched it a third time. I am flat on my ass. And I enjoyed it more each time. This was uh, Tarantino's biggest grossing picture. Really? You know, well, just sort of the stars who were in it. I play Miss Carlson. Fun movie. Carlson. And yes, if I, uh, if I watch a movie and I don't take to it the first time around and uh, Brian says you should watch it again, like maybe... Charlie's going to dig you. God, what was the cowboy movie? Not a close uh, range. Oh. Hell or High Water? Hell or uh, High Water, yeah. I just saw his new movie. Watch that again, too. Enjoyed it the second time. So uh, have your minds changed, people. Watch just, those movies again. The director has a new movie out, Taylor Sheridan, the guy who wrote Sicario. Uh, mm-hmm. He has a new movie with Angela Jolie, where she plays oh, a yeah. smoke jumper. Mm-hmm. And it's actually it's pretty good. Question about this movie, which I saw, and I mean, cinematography, I mean, it's all it's all great. It's all fantastic. Did it... You are fucking dumb. <laughs> did it really even need the Charles Manson angle? Was it even necessary for this? It movie? would have had no ending. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying, like it, it, it seemed, it almost seemed forced because the movie mm. stands on its own so well without that backdrop. Yeah, just following all those guys that had those hit TV shows yeah. in the '60s, and now we're having to do spaghetti westerns. And well, that was like a great I said, story. All you it have to do a... is watch Love Boat with me and Dr. Drew to see all the biggest stars of the '40s and the '50s just literally Cycling wash through. up yeah. onto the Love Boat chart. It was it was a, it was a, a, a through line that tied all together. Where he went to the ranch and they moved in next yeah. door, blah blah blah. Like that. it was kind of there, but you're right. The the, the, was, the meat of the movie didn't. Great right without it, yeah. So uh, I had this conversation at uh, dinner last night with Sonny where he said uh, he'd uh, come up with a plan to, uh, surefire plan to make uh, $15,000. Oh, I'm listening. Big time. I said, what is like this to get in plan? On this. I already have eliminated work <laughs> from whatever this plan is. You know, I wasn't going to buy fuller brushes and go door to door or anything like that. He asked if you had a minute for Amway. He said... Uh, he spilled some water on the ground and said, go walk over that. Yeah. <laughs> he said, um, well, he picked an eight game parlay. Oh my, this is great. Eight games, he said. Oh, I love this. And I said, uh, how did this work? He said, well, mom was in Vegas with Natalia for a volleyball game, and uh, I wanted her to put down 20 bucks on this uh, eight-game parlay. Oh, I love this. But she said, let's up it to 100. Sonny's oh. back on a good graces. Yeah, so I said, what are these games? And he, he then listed every game in his analysis. And NBA games down to, I don't know, who was going to maybe get the MVP of the um, NBA or yeah, whatever it is. cross-sport parlays. Yeah, right? he had a bunch of different stuff going on. We laid it all out. I'd be inclined to trust him. And every single one of these eight games, he had his history worked yeah. out. The last time LeBron played uh, the Golden State Warriors. Yeah. So and so was injured, the and now first he's back. going to fail. <laughs> it's all going to fall like a house of cards. I'm sitting in my. I'm, I'm sort of half tuned in and half. It was a <laughs> labyrinth of of different scenarios and why they were all going to go his it's way. The, 
times eight. It's the Charlie Day meme, you know, where he's got oh, yeah, the, uh, right. uh, he's in the mail room and he's yeah. got right. the uh, strings. I, if there was any, I don't know anything about what you just said, but if Sonny said to me, give me 20 bucks, I have this idea, and that's what it was, I would give it to him without thinking about it. Well, I told him, don't start spending the 15 grand yet. There's, <laughs> there's um, you know, it's eight games. And I said, uh, in what period of time these eight games take over? He said, well, we got a game tonight, then there's multiple games tomorrow, and it's going to take like three days to come to fruition, but then he'll hammer that check. What if he does? Well, I don't think he's going to, because I then uh, adjourned to my office, and I turned on SportsCenter, and I was enjoying a libation and watching SportsCenter, and I noticed that the Hornets were destroyed by the Pacers. Oh. He had it going the other way. And it's always the I, I was first like, leg. I do kind of remember him talking about this game. Uh, they were beat 117 to 144. I mean, you don't That's even. The dr- 144 is a rare score, and if it's not triple overtime. Right. So then I walked into Sonny's room and I said, uh, Wasn't the first game on your parlay the <laughs> Hornets Pacers game? And he's like, Yep. And I was like, who did you have? He's like, the Hornets. And I was like, they were beat by 40 points. That's your first game in it your eighth game my time. parlay. And he's like, yep, well, that's the way it works. And so so like, now what? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Well, now I had to keep thinking about what happened? Upping, like, the, upping the $20 bet to a $100 bet. But so that's, that's the thing. Is it over now? It's over. Oh. Yeah, if you lose he, any leg of a parlay, the He whole lost thing the very apart. first oh. game of his eight-game parlay Poor after guy. laying it out Watch him go seven, seven for eight for the rest of the parlay. Don't celebrate too much because that's a very Chris Carolla move. That's yes. True. So um, there was there was that parlay discussion yeah. I thought mm. you would uh, enjoy. The touchdown dance. I'm, not, too I'm much. not done with mm. him. I think he could have a future with this he certainly could with talk losing bet he could <laughs> def- the wrong could, way <laughs> he could definitely talk about it uh, now if people listen there's going to be a problem <laughs> but he could definitely he i mean olga was enraptured oh, when sure. he was explaining oh, why sure. everything was going to work out this way yeah. all right gina you have uh, a commercial to show me no i don't mm. have a commercial to show you i have the commercial to Ooh. show you i stumbled upon something that i I I know for a fact you've never seen or it would have come up a thousand times by Mm -hmm. now. Um, It's hard to set up and it it is a little bit visual, but it does involve Grace Jones and Adam Ant. Mm. So everyone just picture what you're about to see. Wow. And just even from the from the audio, see if you could venture a guess what they're selling. Where'd you find this? I just found it in the rabbit hole of the Internet. Uh, Someone sent it to you. No, I found it on YouTube. (laughs) Thank you. All right, there's Adam Ant. I don't know, Grace. Come on, Adam. Hey. I can't. <laughs> it's easy. I've never ridden one. It's quick. I've never ridden anything. Honda ever. scooter. It's fun. I don't even drive. Honda scooters. They're everything but ordinary. Oh. It's sexy. I'll take it. I'll take you. Oh. She improvised it. Woo! She's biting his ear really off. Really is giving a good ear. <laughs> Have you ever seen no. that commercial? That I was feel like, that was I feel like that was a European market uh, yeah. commercial. That wasn't made for the Midwest. <laughs> for Kansas Asian. City. Yeah. It said models not available in all states. Mm. I have oh. some recollection. Of, oh, you do. That yeah. aired here. Yeah, that's that. Wow. That was in the in the in the in the MTV days. The the early MTV. Oh, days. that makes sense. Because I was going to say, who are they marketing the scooter to? But like, yeah, like uh, you know. Those kids that are watching MTV. I uh, had uh, super fan Geo sent me what he said was his uh, favorite Bertram call oh. uh, last night, and I listened to it and I I forgot about it. So we'll we'll play that three minute call from uh, Kevin and Bean circa nineteen ninety four ninety five. So just to set the table on this uh, next Bertram call, um, Bertram hated all of his students sure but he did have his favorite student who was brad higginstaller okay and uh higginstaller was it, all great horrible teachers have a lot of love for one kid that just it, it exacerbates the hatred they have for the others so it <laughs> makes you feel like it's one thing it's one thing if you're Mom and your dad hate you and your sister. Right. But, oh. if, but if they hate you and love your sister, it is worse. Sure, of course. It makes it worse. And so, why shop, can't you be more like Higginstaller? Yeah, shop teachers 
were the most hateful teachers I've ever, ever had, but the, the pain level would only be at about an eight unless there was a favorite chosen right. student, which then made all the rest of us feel like complete horse shit. Right. So uh, this is Burcham, sadly, calling in to uh, Kevin and Bean from the shop class, I'd, I'd learned this time, uh, <laughs> to uh, mourn the loss oh, no. of uh, his favorite student. Top teacher who calls us from time to time. Mr. Bertram, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, hey. I'm, hey, don't monkey. Don't monkey. Oh, you got trouble with the kids again? Got a dime holding up a dollar here. <laughs> I understand. How was your Memorial Day weekend? Oh, you... Screw it. Listen. <laughs> weekend. I, I'm calling from the shop phone at school with some real troubling news, fellas. All right, yeah. I had a fifth semester prize student, Brad Higginsaller. I've talked about him before. The only good one in the batch. Anyway, he was out at Lake Havasu over the long weekend testing out a kayak I helped him build last semester. Right. Well, about a half mile offshore, the kayak disintegrated. <laughs> right. Oh, wow. Was struck by a houseboat. <laughs> <laughs> you know how fast those houseboats move. Ah, uh, drunken fraternity kids <laughs> having a fun time. As you know, my students are like my children, so. Anytime something happens to one of Hey, knock it off! I'll put your head in a bench fight! <laughs> yeah, we can tell you have a lot of love for them, Mr. Birch. Uh, some of them. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, guys. So what uh, happened to Brad? Is he okay? Well, they haven't found him yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to hear Brad's that. Brad's still partying. Oh, like they haven't found him, so I'm... I'm prepared to brace myself for the worst. Yeah. Well, I hope the Higgins Doll family isn't listening right now. This would be a bad way to hear about it. Well, I... I prepared a, a short tribute to Brad. Oh, that's lovely. Entitled, The Shop Teacher's Prayer. Okay, The Shop Teacher's Prayer. Do you need any kind of music for this? I'm looking for something. I got something. All right, go ahead. <laughs> Brad, I taught you about wood, and you taught me about myself. <laughs> you know, Brad, Jesus Christ was a carpenter. <laughs> And it's no coincidence that you when I had this dude is great. I'm trying to talk about a dead guy here. It's just no respect to where was I? I don't Jesus know. Christ was a carpenter. I'm gonna retire your shop smock and name a router bit after you. That's big. But listen, Brad. If you believe in forever, then love is just a one night stand. <laughs> There's a wood shop in heaven. Well, they just got one hell of a man. I gotta go, fellas. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll break it up. All right. Thanks, Mr. Bridget. I remember doing that call from the living room of the house I rented in La Crescenta, and I had a, I had a, uh, oh, God, what I have? I, I had tools around mm -hmm. me. I think I had a belt sander and I had like a drill. Well, this is the living room of your house anyway. <laughs> yeah, That's just how they were think. there. I needed to fire the stuff. I was like holding it in my hand and putting oh, it off like in the a, distance. Like a and gun <laughs> salute. Firing. I was firing off so I could be distracted, oh, so I God. could yell at, <laughs> at the, the kids, students. So. And I think I had, I think I probably had like Cat Stevens like on a, on a boom box or something and I was like hitting play and like firing up the tools and screaming. This is Bolt? very Phil Hendry-esque yeah. of you. Yeah, Fully and gross sound effects. Totally analog uh, back then but uh, Brad shall be uh, shall be missed. Mm. I can't, I thought I had a joke in there but I guess I didn't. I, maybe it came up later where I was blaming myself for Brad's demise because we used a water soluble gl glue on his on his kayak uh, and it, of course and it disintegrated, disintegrated right. out in the uh, middle of the lake and it was it was he was struck by a fast moving houseboat that's that's what basically brought Brad down <laughs> all right uh, we got made up movie we got the uh, title we have an intro here bald or or Dawson? Yeah, got Dawson's it. got yeah. one? What do you want to do, Dawson? Yeah. In a world where titles are many and plots are few, one man can take your movie names and make them come to life. What is going on? Adam Carolla stars in Made Up Movie. 
All right. Let's see. We got a Twitter entry from uh, Ronald Harrison. Mixed Vegetables is the name of his mm. movie. Now, you can't call someone a vegetable anymore. That's I think I think it's a farcical okay. movie. All right. I think it's got elements of awakening in oh it. Oh my god, so Robert, like great Robert movie. De Niro. Oh, that's a great movie. Hey, look, if if this comes from uh an English actor like uh, Eddie Ooh. Izzard or someone like right. that, let's period see. piece. Like Dana Day Lewis. You know I'm saying if you yeah. said it in like 1890, no, I, you, I mean? yeah, we could do period, right? And I'm, but I'm thinking it uh, more. Oh God, what's his name from Run Fat Boy Run? Oh, uh, uh, Peg Simon Peg Simon Peg, like mm. a Simon Peg mm. period thing. Yep, where he's the hapless. All right, go ahead. Yeah. He's the hapless son of the guy yep. who runs the mm-hmm. sanatorium or mm. whatever it is, yes. and dad dies mysteriously and overnight and immediately, and he's. He's forced, forced with having over. to show yes. up. In it. But because he knows nothing, he's able to help. You know what I mean? So he's constantly okay. saying, like, well, we should go out and we should take people outside and we should play a game of Foursquare or we should play a game of something. And all the nurses are like, they can't do that. They right. don't understand. But they start, well, why not? They yeah. start yeah. catching on because he doesn't, he doesn't know anything. Yes. And Awakenings is a great jumping off point. Also, I don't know if you remember the movie The Dream Team. Yes. I believe mm-hmm. Peter Michael Boyle, Keaton. Michael Keaton. It right. has elements of that, that. You're right. Out of the mouths of babes, he transforms these people. Right. And there's a little reverse... Ooh. There's a little reverse Sleeping Beauty thing because he falls in love with a comatose girl. <laughs> It, it's non-sexual at first. He, he loves that there's upon, someone there to listen. Upon her awakening, <laughs> he well, he fought for before. Okay, but then, but the kiss awakens oh, her. Oh, true love's we're, kiss. We're, we're flipping the script wow. on on this one. Maybe so Margot Robbie. There's like a Kate Blanchett character who's like the old nurse ratchet. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. She's stuck in her ways. You know, the, these patients can't do right. anything. We're here to tend to them. And then there's a young Margot Edie Robbie. Edie Falco plays perfect. the oh, nurse. Yeah. And then there's right? a young Margot Robbie type. You're right. Who's who's the young upstart? She, she reads books. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? She's like, she's got new ideas. And only Simon Pegg is willing to listen. Right. And there's a lot of comedy because it's a period piece. And she was like reading in a book about things we know now work. But there's... She's like being totally t- dismissed. called a heretic, yeah. yes. right? That's real good. A lot of this is linked to childhood trauma, apparently. Quiet right. witch. <laughs> That's right. More leeches. <laughs> Mixed vegetables. Again, I don't think we could pull this off, but but a Sasha Baron Cohen type mm. or uh, someone someone a real who's, raconteur. Yeah, someone who's got a who's got a little international coverage. That's Ooh. right. I wouldn't mind Jeff mm. Goldblum being in this either. Ricky Gervais. Could yeah, pull Ricky for Gervais. Us. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Ricky Gervais. Simon Pegg. Mm. Yes. They run this. They run this That's thing good. now. Ricky. Oh, brothers. Ricky. Yeah. And Ricky brothers. Ricky's the brother who sees it is. He sees these patients as basically free labor for his house painting <laughs> business, you know. So he's constantly sure. saying, "Like I'm going to take them on a field trip to the aquarium." Right. Like, why are they wearing coveralls? <laughs> why is there painters tape everywhere? Right. I can't trust those dolphins. That's right. All right. Should we talk to uh, Dan at the top here? Dan, thirty-five, yep. Baltimore. That would be me. You got a uh, movie title for us? Mm-hmm. Must release. Must release. Must release. Correct. It's a tough one. I don't know where to go with this. All I mean, right. I think of release. I think of like releasing something into the wild. I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about catch and release. Yeah, yeah, I'm thinking, thinking about like yeah. a fishing mm-hmm, thing. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking about um, a. Uh, oh, okay. I'm gonna <laughs> stay with my theme here. Um, it's a period fishing comedy. Uh, the dad dies suddenly. <laughs> he leaves a, an, a fishing camp, Airbnb type or uh, B and B type yeah. fishing camp. Okay. To Ricky Gervais. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> he's getting a lot of work. He's got this broken down old old camp. Aha. He's got this old fishing camp. Okay. Yeah. And he and he dies off and he leaves it to his daughter. Okay. okay. His daughter is a summer camp type situation. Yeah, realizes yeah. that this is not a money maker. He's constantly been been losing money. The the fly fishing and the catch and release doesn't work. She turns it into a brothel. <laughs> I'm with you. Now, of course, she doesn't tell her mom. 
She keeps all the themes the same. Who keeps poking around, wanting to know what the hell is going? Like, why this did you put good. a bar in? Yes. You know, we didn't need a bar in here. These people and, bring their own booze. And you know? she and she keeps the same name. You know, so instead of the Bunny Ranch, it's the Catfish Pond. Right. Can we so reunite nobody knows. Amy Adams and uh, Glenn Close from Hillbilly Elegy? Yes. yes. I think we could. Yes. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Amy Adams is the daughter. Oh, yeah, right. Glenn Close plays right. the crotchety mom. Right. Set in her ways. Yeah. Doesn't like what's going on, but does start noticing the cash is coming in. That's right. All of a sudden, the truck gets upgraded. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, the boat gets upgraded. John Goodman is the nosy sheriff. Okay. <laughs> The He's coming around. He wants to know what's going right, on in right. here. Why can't he fish? All of a sudden, why you guys flush with cash? Yeah. How come uh, none of the usual regulars are here anymore? I see some frat guys out walking of town around. License plates. Yeah. Yeah. People diving into the pond. Right. Carousing. Right. right. He's mm. nosing around. He yeah. wants to know what's going on. But he takes a shining to the widow. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, Glenn <laughs> Close. Glenn Close. Sure, yeah, sure, takes yeah. a shine. Well, we, she's not all dressed down. You know, no, no, we, she's, we, not, she's not. She's yeah, dowdy. She's, she's, she's Oscar's dowdy. Glenn Close. Right. She's dancing, doing the yeah, booty doing the butt. hustle. To the butt. Yeah, yeah. What do you think, uh, Dan? <laughs> Hit the nail on the head. Boston Nuts was the theme. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Just what you're thinking, right? Correct. Thank you, man. All right. Let's see. Let's do one more here. We got uh, Joshua Brown from Twitter. Ooh, I, I, I'm interested one. in Kevin's. Yeah, same. It's called, um, oh, sorry. We got Kevin, too. Oh, we got new ones. Sorry. Um, we you want to yeah. do Kevin's? Yeah, this is interesting. Called Sliding Scale. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, weight loss is always all the rage. There's mm-hmm. always different like fad this. diets like that this. come up. And you, You're we, a slave to the you, scale. You've mm-hmm. heard of every diet, every trick in the book. Mm. But there's this new place where people go and... They're losing weight like crazy, and they feel Mm -hmm. great about themselves. And every time they step on the scale, it's going down, and they feel great about themselves. little shallow hal in here. And they don't know what it is, but here's the trick. Trick scale. Mm -hmm. They just feel better about themselves. They're not walking around with doubt anymore and shame. And their lives are all improved. They're living their lives for the first time because they feel worthy, but the scale's a trick scale. It's getting a little cathartic, Jana. (laughs) They're getting ready for a wedding. They got a new Subaru Outback. (laughs) Sorry, we're doing made-up movie now? (laughs) Okay, let's start. So is this a clinic or they sell these scales? No, this is a clinic. Like, you got to go in. They give you the high five. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you have ever been in a Weight Watchers, but uh, you stand in line. Mm -hmm. You jump on that scale. Then you Mm -hmm. have a little chit-chat with the person. Oh, maybe. Uh Oh, intrigue. Maybe it's a little VW screwing with what's coming out of the mm-hmm, tailpipe on their mm-hmm, diesels. Mm-hmm. So they open this, fa- they have this clinic, this yeah. weight loss. It's failing. Yeah. So they start <laughs> getting in, the pond. they start getting in cooking it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like when you roll the odometer right. back on a yes. used car or whatever. The so they go, on the you can scale. only use our yeah. facility and our scale because we also do a body mass yes. indexing oh. and they put a fake pincher right. like on the person and all of a sudden. It's starting to go well. People yeah. are noticing results. You got to have that scene where the where the client's getting on the scale, and as she does, like the guy's going, oh, this, you just "Don't step on that!" It's and she steps on. Oh my god, I'm down three pounds. I can't. Right. He's like, "Hmm, I love this place." And, of, like, hmm. and of course, right. the big you know the big uh, crescendo when everybody realizes they've been had, and they're going on the lynch mob after the guy that runs it. They go, "Wait a second, you you would never get off the couch before. You were too busy bitching about your yeah. life and being sad, and look mm-hmm. at you now. And mm-hmm. you, you asked for that raise." <laughs> Scoring score. <laughs> yep, yep. Right. All right. Who's in this thing? That's a good question. I. Do we dare cast like plus, not plus sides, like Melissa McCarthy or Rebel Wilson, that kind of thing? I like or? that. I think a lot of every woman, I think there's a there's room for Alice and Janney to mm. maybe work there. A little older, yeah. Yeah. Not older, but you know what I mean. I'm a, That'd uh, be a good, seasoned actress. interesting conversation with <laughs> Rebel and her agent. I need you to put the weight back on. Oh, yeah. She worked so got hard to get it a big fat role. I mean, a large, I yeah, mean, juicy. A, I mean, a significant <laughs> Succulent. role for you, Rebel. Sizable role. <laughs> Sizable. <laughs> All right, let's talk to uh, Jason42 from Henderson, Nevada. Jason? Hello. Hello? Ace Man, get it on. What's going on? So, my movie title is called 10 Minutes from Mexico. All right. I got a thought. Mm. Let's hear it. This is, uh, what's, uh, what do they got? Honduras there? El Salvador? It's, uh, Nicar- it's a Central American country, yes. Yeah, no, I'm looking for uh, what's on the what's on the border. Oh, gosh. What oh, was that? Nicaragua? Nicar- uh, 
Honduras. El Salvador? El Salvador. We'll figure it out. Panama? No. Costa Rica. <laughs> no. Portugal. Um, Guatemala, I think. On the, I think go. Guatemala is on the border. But anyway. <laughs> this is sad. <laughs> All right. Cut the, Chris, cut this out. What'd you think of that, Justin? <laughs> I'm going with Guatemala. Or Jason. <laughs> All right. So wait a minute. Okay. There's a guy. He's uh, played by... <clears throat> God, what is that? All right, I'll think of the guy. Okay. Hispanic actor. There's a there's a Michael a, Pena. There's a bumbling mm-hmm. loser, f- bumbling, fumbling like Walter Mitty type son mm-hmm. of a drug cartel kingpin, <laughs> okay. right? Okay. And he's got to work in the business. Mm-hmm. He's not going to get a job at the Starbucks right. in Tijuana. He's mm-hmm. got to be in the business, but he's such a fuck up. You know, he's got his buff, good looking brothers and they're running the yeah. fentanyl right. and they're running the, the human trafficking right. and all that kind of stuff. And the, the Don, the kind of the kingpin dad just says, look, uh, I only trust you to drive the bus from Guatemala. And honestly, even that, I don't trust you that much. It, there's a bunch of migrants on the Guatemalan-Mexican mm-hmm. border. It is Guatemala. And we're just, I, you're going to drive the short bus in between, you know, back and forth. And I don't really trust you to tunnel or throw anyone over the fence right. or run a Chinese meth lab or anything. But That's got to be a heavy hitter. That's an Anto- it's a Benicio Del Toro type. The, right. the kingpin. Yeah, I, right. think, but it's I got think Michael a little, Pena would be a good son in this. It's got a little that, uh, like, remember when Robert De Niro was doing, like, Analyze This and uh-huh. stuff? It's got, like, the, the kingpin violence with the comedy, the yeah, the, yeah, yeah. with the humor in it. So this guy is forced to drive the, mm-hmm. drive the bus and uh, Penelope Cruz mm. and her two young daughters mm. are amongst the refugees. Who, of course, love is found along the journey. We make some political statements. Mm-hmm. You know, we they have get besieged by MS-13. Yeah, we have the camera crew from Cox. You know, we all know it's Fox, right? With the blonde, sure, sure. and she's talking, and right. he's giving speeches about equity and right. stuff like mm-hmm. that, and turns the corner realizes probably at the end that this isn't the life opens an orphanage instead in Guatemala. The, 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 the running thing is that like the, the, uh, maybe it's Antonio Banderas, maybe it's someone, the, 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 the enemy, the, the nemesis, the guy who's trying to take over the cartel is like, Oh, his son is, ta- is, is taking this thing. And this is our opportunity to get in, get him, get, so, you know, he, right. he's right constantly now. trying to get him the yeah. whole time. Danger. He's on his heels. Yes. I like that 10 minutes from Mexico is the other side of Mexico. That's where my genius comes yeah, in. Good. I was thinking San Diego, yeah. and I went the other Ten way. South, because I mixed it. I flipped the script. I did. <laughs> they flipped the map. Yeah, Jason. I think you hit the nail on the head. Powerful. Although right? it had yeah. to be a short bus. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a shortish that. bus. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, uh, Jason. Thanks, Ace man. All right. Uh, anything uh, look good up there, Justin? I swear we've Joe. done line four. I swear we have. Line four? No, I don't want to do it. I'm telling you we've done it. Uh, really? Mm, maybe. Let's see. You want to go line two? Yeah, let's do that. Line two, Justin, 30, Alabama. Hey there. Get it on. Hey, guy. Uh, bang for your buck is my movie title. It's a hunting movie. Every time we do this, we do at least one where the title's ca- name, uh, the character's name is yeah. in the title. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's about a guy named Buck. Right. Right. He's a hunter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And mm-hmm. he has a hunting school. Oh no. Mm-hmm. He's raising. He's sort of. Uh, he's raising a, a step kid who is not into hunting. Mm. He's he's very Michael liberal, Payne, very yeah. Greenpeace. Uh, let's I mean? have let's have Liam Neeson be Buck. Okay. 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 Timothy Chalamet is his young son, Buck Jr. <laughs> yeah. Now, what happens? I'm going to go a little, um, God, what was that Wahlberg movie? Shooter or something like yeah, that. Yeah, we have called Shooter, yeah. All right. So Buck, who's opened this sort of hunting academy mm-hmm. or school or whatever, of course, at some point we find retired CIA, Green oh. Beret, Navy SEAL, mm-hmm. Marksman Academy and whatever, and he's left it. Left right, it all, long ago. all right. behind. Yeah. Everyone thinks of him as a doddering old man. Right. But he was a badass in his day. Right. And they have to teach. He's trying to teach his young young stepson uh, the ways of, of hunting mm-hmm. and this, that, and the other. Of course, son's uh, no good at it, doesn't want any part of it, until the uh, unmarked SUVs start rolling up the dirt. Mm, that's right. The dirt highway. The they reason back. 
The reason we know there's SUVs coming up the dirt highway is we're tight on the dog who's sleeping on the porch and he pops his head up, up and, yep. and turns. That's how that's so how know. we know, you know. And then uh, we have that scene where they go, uh, is this Buck McDeever? And he goes, who's asking? Yeah. And then they got one last. We need you back, We Buck. need you back. It, it yeah. is now. Yeah. That's not his real name. And then they say. I used to be. Yeah. Then they, yeah, I used to be. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And then they do this one. This is a, I work alone. And they go, this is a two-man job. Right. And he goes, I don't trust anybody inside or whatever. But he looks at his looks son. Looks at the kid. Yeah. That's looks right. at the kid. Now the kid's got, and he does that thing where the kid doesn't know anything about his sure. past, right? Kids just think like he's some old guy daughter, runs yeah. out yeah. hunting, whatever. And he went, you know, I've been waiting for some time to show you this and the kid goes what and he goes into his office and he hits that button and flips. all the all the yeah, flips yeah, yeah, and there's yeah, all yeah. the weapons all the and all the all the purple hearts right. and all the stuff around. and the yeah. kid's like what whose is this yeah this used to be mine and now it will be again. in another life in another life and yeah. then he starts gearing up now now i don't know we got to figure out what the mission is well the, the kid obviously not being 100 more techie or whatever right. he uses skills you know to help the he dad uses, he yeah because the mainframes yeah because he's complaining he's playing video right. games all That's day right. and you know but we have that scene early on where it's like i don't know how to check the voicemail on my phone right. can you uh, yeah yeah not uh, dad yeah Right. You couldn't do anything if it wasn't around. Is, uh, sorry, is Justin still, Justin? Yeah, I'm here. That's uh, 100 Rotten Tomatoes. What, oh. uh, <laughs> yeah. but we still haven't really figured out the mission yet. <laughs> I've got to figure yeah. out, you know. Well, I mean, is it like a red, well, the SUVs, SUVs came in. Um, uh, you know, I thought you were going to go like a Red Dawn approach for it when you mentioned that part, like there's about to be the government takeover type. Type ordeal. Is there a militia he has to infiltrate or something? Maybe he's up here in the woods of Michigan or something. I would just yes. assume Russians. Yeah. yeah, there's a white supremacist Russian militia <laughs> crossing over from Canada. He's up in the woods and yeah. he has to infiltrate <laughs> because they have a plot to assassinate the president. Yeah. All right. I think we've uh, I think we've covered it. I'd see that. That's a hit. All right. We good or you want to do one more? I think we're good. All right. Let's go to the high note. Let's go to the high note. All right. <laughs> Adam Carolla will return in Made Up Movie Part 2. All right, let me tell you about Humble CBD based out of Southern California. Humble makes it insanely, they make an insanely great hemp-derived CBD product for any occasion. Humble is committed to helping you stay grounded no matter what life throws at you. Their line of CBD products is geared to help you focus, relax, and recover, and uh, and beyond. Only uh, for my listeners, Humble is offering 25% off your first order. Just use the promo code ADAM. Save on your entire order site-wide. So head to www.humblecbd.com. And uh, choose from any product that meets your needs. Stay grounded. Stay humble. Stay straight. Stay smooth with Humble CBD. All right. We'll take a quick break. We'll do the news right after this. The news with Gina Grad. I just had a thought as we start the news, and I always hear Kamala because that's my favorite part. Where the hell's she been? She's not been on the border. That's I, that I, much I know. I check Fox every day, and I love that they're doing like the daily count. Of, oh, you know, are like, they? Yeah, it's like fifty-eight days since Kamala Harris has said anything about the border. What? It's like, where is she? What? It's so funny you mentioned that. I just, I just saw a tweet today from some outlet that was like, "Oh, Kamala Harris's approval ratings are like way down." I'm like, "Why? 
Like no, she's I, I, nowhere and to I found. had that thought. I was like, what? But I haven't. I, no, she hasn't said or no. done anything. I have no idea why to be up right now. Until that song, I just remembered her. Like I totally forgot about her until this moment. So speaking of uh, White House drama, the Office of New York Attorney General Letitia James announced Tuesday that the ongoing probe into the Trump Organization is now a criminal matter, and they let the company run by the former president know it. Fabian Levy, a spokesperson for the Attorney General's office, said, "We have informed the Trump." organization that our investigation into the company is no longer purely civil in nature. We're now actively investigating the Trump organization in a criminal capacity, along with the Manhattan DA. We have no additional comment at this time. Was I telling so Garagos has been talking about this for a while. Garagos also has a thought, Mm -hmm. but I don't know if we talked about this. I don't think so. Um, He thinks that Trump if he stays in Florida, will avoid extradition. I, I've been seeing a lot of because that. Ron DeSantis will won't allow that. Won't allow it. I had this. Uh, I have a lot of conspiracy theories lately. I said to Gerges, if something happens to Biden, and something may happen to Biden, it doesn't. I mean, I don't see him going straight through for four years. No, he's a I, frail old man. He's Anything a frail old man. Anytime. Anything could happen. Now, I don't say. He's going to wake up dead. That's what happened to my grandfather. You can wake up dead. I'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying that as we learned with with Trump, mm-hmm. you can get a kind of medical deferment. Right. Like you can go, hey, two years in, he's not really fit yeah. to run the country. Right. In which case, Kamala mm-hmm. would uh, have to leave her post at the border, <laughs> come back to the White House. I she, said she, she, she sees a shadow. I out. said to um, I said to Garagos, if Kamala becomes the president and Trump is uh, held up in Mar-a-Lago mm. and uh, DeSantis has said he's not going to extradite him, I could see Kamala sending in SEAL Team 6 Ooh. and bringing him to justice. <laughs> That's, That's a, a good movie. movie. <laughs> Sounds a little far-fetched now, but I don't know. Actually, the way wait. things have been going, it doesn't sound that far-fetched. We did that with Roger Stone. Yeah. So it can happen. Yeah, I guess he was in Florida, and they sent yeah. him the, yeah, the I, team. They rappelled down the fucking side of the, the vows. I, of course, have seen the same uh, thing about the Ron DeSantis uh, extradition. There is, this has been debunked. I've read many articles. There is no extradition problem. That's why we have these 50 states. They can extradite anyone they want anywhere, anytime. Hmm. The, the, the Supreme Court has been, Garagos knows about a million times more about this than I do, but apparently the Supreme Court has ruled many times that uh, there are no restrictions about moving people across mm. straight lines. Well, France. again, things are fluid. Who knows? Oh, okay, Who yes. knows laws can be what, changed. what happens? Yeah. Yes, two years from now. Speaking of laws, Florida yeah. could be its could just break Succeed. off and be its own nation That's two true. years from now, the way things are going That's in Florida. Nice. Nice. Speaking of, well, secession, I think they've had this argument for too. USA Today reports that Texas Governor Greg Abbott has signed into law legislation that prohibits abortion once a fetal heartbeat is detected, effectively banning most abortions in the state. The measure would allow virtually any private citizen to sue an abortion provider or others who aid and abet an abortion in violation of the new ban. Opponents of the law argue that it will prohibit abortions before most women even know they're pregnant. Any private citizen who has nothing to do with the case? It, it, citizens arrest. Interesting. Virtually any private damages. citizen to sue. Um, effectively outlawing the procedure altogether. It also does not include exceptions in cases of rape or incest. That's a caveat that has long been the standard in abortion laws. And just out of curiosity, because I didn't know, um, I don't know when women generally realize they're pregnant, so I looked it up. Um, it's between usually four to seven weeks you even realize you're pregnant. And um, would... Is the heartbeat, I heard something about 15 weeks. I don't know where, where I got that number, but I heard 15 weeks. So maybe. I heard that too. Oh, you did? Yeah. So maybe that's. I mean, more or less. I don't know if it's exact. Yeah. But... I, I have a lot of questions, though. Mm-hmm. I, I was, you know, like I like to keep it to uh, recipes and kittens for most of social media. But man, recipes I, for death, <laughs> recipes for kittens. I, I had a lot of questions on Twitter and every guy had something to say about it. I, God forbid I ask a question. But I don't you feel like this is pretty disingenuous and hypocritical? I mean, there's first of all, Texas is at the bottom 
for, I mean, I looked up a ton of stuff for education, for teen pregnancy, for sexually active minors. Um, uh, what else? Uh, they, they, they execute people. If we're worried about heartbeats, do those people have heartbeats or don't they? And by the way, I don't give a shit if they execute people or not. Yeah. Why isn't there a caveat for rape and incest? Why are there people that can dime you out for trying to help a, a woman get out of a situation? I, I don't know why they would include and- well, that's certainly incest for sure and rape for, you and know, why, seems weird and, to put and that And when do there. we start, and this is just kind of to prove the point, when do we start jailing the men who aren't financially and emotionally providing for pregnant women and helping to raise these children until they're 18? Like, Rock what is, that what pussy is, hat. Th- yeah. what, what is this? This is 2021 and th- this is this is insane. Um, well, the thing about... Here's my take on, uh, is it, you can find out if it's 15 weeks or not. The fif- the 15 weeks is, there's an article saying that a baby, or the, the fetus develops ears and they can hear your heartbeat at 15 oh. weeks, but fetal heartbeat is six, six weeks. weeks, yeah. All right, so my world, we just create a, we agree on a number like we do with enlisting in the army you know it's kind of natural thing like 18 age i would like i would say the same with consent just Mm -hmm. kind of come up with 16 18 for the the thing and like 21 for booze and and whatever that is and we just come up with some number 20 weeks or whatever the week number is and just go that's our that's our mason dixon line that makes sense to me this is just i i just think this is so eerie in 2021 well i don't is it gonna pass he signed it i mean it's law the governor signed it i don't know if i'm missing something about you know it being vetoed or it being overturned well now now uh texas is gonna have to secede and be its own Hmm. i think they've tried that before i think they might yeah it's they'll probably do it before um before uh, Florida does, and and because some Yahoo had the, uh, I for lack of a better word, the audacity to say, well, so what do you think is the right amount for an abortion? Eight months? Don't people understand that just because you don't support one extreme, it doesn't mean you are on the side of the other extreme? When did people get so stupid? Don't you know how Twitter works? I can't <laughs> stand how dumb every. And God forbid you make you make a statement. All of a sudden, it turns into an octagon. Why? Why are why are people allowed to be? And by the way, delicate flowers. If this is what you wanted, you won. Why are you still bitching? Why are you still talking to me? Yeah, I'm just gonna. I don't know what the states. I don't know what the neighboring states are, but people are just gonna do what they do with everything. They just do a out. gun version and a booze version, and then, you know they make guns illegal here, right. and then people just cross over right. into whatever and they buy their guns, and that's what's gonna happen with later term abortions. That's I weird. guess You're- later after six weeks. Is it really six weeks? That is too. That and is when early. You don't and when many women don't know they're pregnant until two months. Whoopsie! Yeah, it also it's also an indictment of how fat most people are. These that's days. true. <laughs> that's no, that's true. true. But go so, ahead. It's weird how like you uh, you talk about rightfully, in my opinion, like the the the, the weird arcane like um, uh, alcohol laws from state to state. You can buy it here right. on Sunday, but you can't hear. Yeah, uh, Kansas, uh, Missouri, for eight a.m. or we can't hear. But for some reason, like this across the state thing is like okay for you know for some people. Yeah, but, but I, I don't know. Laws effective September first, so get those late term or medium term <laughs> or, or early or early uh, abortions in while the and, sun is still shining. And just FYI, all the st- I have this whole thing of stats because I was so fascinated this morning reading this. All of the stats I got about the some of the dire situation in Texas regarding teen pregnancy, education, no condoms, no t- teaching about this in schools. I didn't get it off of the Planned Pregnancy website. I got it off of an adoptiontexas.org. So it's not like I'm I just Googled it and that was the first thing that came up. So it doesn't it's not a one sided thing. This is just information. Well, Gina, I got good news and bad news. Okay. Good news is we all agree with you. Bad news is we're still all moving to Texas. <laughs> so. I mean, I'll it's real go. Double edged sword. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Will I be able to afford to buy a house in Texas? Uh, not after we all move there. So oh, you're going to have to uh, oh. swallow your pride and all get right. on the bus. All right. All right. <laughs> Let's move on. I mean, I could go on and on. Paul Hogan, good news, he's still alive. 
Brian and I weren't sure for a second. A mm. Crocodile Dundee star Paul Hogan is apparently fed up with a homeless crisis taking place in L.A. And he has done something about it. He's 81 years old and he was photographed uh, penning a letter and putting it on the front of his house in Venice Beach that says, this is my house, not yours. Tyler Proctor, who is a politician in the area. I wish oh. I could do an Australian <laughs> accent because I'd go, now that's a tent. <laughs> that's a house. <laughs> Recently spoke of the increase in homelessness in Venice Beach and even specifically referred to Hogan's home location as a hell on earth. Wow. Residents around the Venice boardwalk are demanding action from authorities saying it's turned into a dangerous homeless encampment has been hit by an increase of violent incidents. So hopefully Paul's sign on his house will keep him from being bothered. I heard that half the fires that the like the L.A. fire department was responding to were homeless related mm-hmm. fires. I can see that. Yeah. Why wouldn't there be yeah. half? When was the last time you saw a fire? Uh, it's, I, like in, in no I mean? people, in yeah, people. You know, houses used to have electrical shortages. Right. They don't yeah. now. And then also, Deep turkeys around the holidays. There was also mm-hmm. the one I miss: falling asleep while smoking. Oh yeah, that was the number one. And the sofa yep. went up, and the whole thing. It's funny. We call it falling asleep while smoking. It's passing it's, out. It's blacking while, while, out. You blacked out. Yeah. You passed out. For sure. Yeah. Uh, TMZ reports that Johnny Depp is fighting tooth and nail to uncover whether his ex, Amber Heard, actually did donate millions of dollars to charity, like she said she would. And he's even going so far as to sue the organization that was supposed to get the money to get to the bottom of this. Depp sued the ACLU in an effort to obtain financial documents as he seeks to undo a judge's ruling in London last year where the son had defamed him in 2018, called him a wife beater in the headline. That's where this ACLU drama comes in. So Johnny and his legal team are attempting to prove Amber perjured herself in court when she claimed she donated $7 million to the ACLU and Children's Hospital LA. That's what she said she was going to do. Just walk away. No, I can't. Depp away. thinks Heard only donated 450000 from her own pocket and uh, pocketed the rest. And he says the ACLU has refused to play ball with him. They're not turning over the documents. So now he wants a judge to step in and get those numbers. Is he working? Oh, I sense a pirate six coming out. <laughs> Didn't he get uncast from something because from, of this? Um, horrible beasts yeah. or, or whatever the fucking Harry Potter spinoff mm. is. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, he's going to unemploy himself, right? That's an interesting question. Does Johnny Depp, is he like secure for life? He's got the pirate. Well, on but him. remember no, during he had the a divorce. Spending yeah, issue, he has I a think. real habit of he like. Had a, kind of a wine uh and... michael jackson really? nick cage yes. kind of spending yes. issue that was going yeah. on i think but rem- i mean i don't know this amber heard situation remember she wrote that op-ed about how he's beating her and then there was some uh, uncovering of it's like that footage not being... of someone throwing a wine glass at somebody yeah but then uh, and then there was the great moment where somebody took a shit in his bed and that he had someone had to say that on in trial that's um, gross it's great it, it's gross. <laughs> I mean, shitting in the bed. Oh, yeah. Unless right. Amber Heard did it. Well, and that was the implication. Then it's jackable. Uh, now it's jackable. Really? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I would love for Elon and Johnny to get together and share some war stories over Amber. Yeah. I'll... I'd be curious. I bet you Elon know. doesn't know what Eskimo brother means. Oh, you're probably right. He's probably one of those guys that's yeah. too, 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 too much thinking about outer oh, space. Well, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have video of this, but The Hollywood Reporter says Jimmy Kimmel roasted the post-pandemic broadcast television landscape at Disney's annual Upfront presentation on Tuesday. He delivered a searing stand-up routine during the uh, during the company's streaming event to advertisers in which he mocked the traditional broadcast networks, ABC and all of them, even Disney Plus and Amazon. There were so many jokes, and they were so goddamn funny. But here's just three, just to give you an idea of him saying this to that audience. It's a virtual upfront. Yes. Have and, you guys and, ever been to an upfront? No. No. Upfronts. I haven't had too many shows on network TV. <laughs> I'm trying to sell. But, but for the handful you made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No. no, I know. I didn't I, make I, it. I was too busy. Upfronts used to be a, we- a, it's a bygone era. I, I, I wonder, it might be one of those things that got like a restaurant that got permanently closed by the mm-hmm. pandemic. I don't know we if we're going to have those. With, you know, I've probably done five to eight, maybe 10 My upfronts. God. I've done them with Jimmy. Uh, 
I've done them in New York. I've done them from like all different networks. It's always, it was a big thing. They put mm. on a big, they pull out all the stops. It's an and event. It's a big event. And it's always the best food and the best booze and the best, the best event. Uh, How would you know? Locations. You don't get there until you uh, are supposed to go on. It's true. Well, that was always funny when uh, my, must have been one of my first upfronts. I know I've told you guys a story, but it still, it always makes me laugh. It was at the Four Seasons in Pasadena or whatever, the Ritz Carlton mm. maybe in Pasadena. And, you know, it was on a Sunday and famously the car was going to pick me and Jimmy up at 11 and then the upfront started at 12 and then John Stewart was going to start it. And then the ab fab girls mm-hmm. oh, yeah. were going to go second. And then me and Jimmy were going to go third with our presentation. Oh, the third spot in the lineup. <laughs> I was doing the upfront math. I'm like, we're not hitting that stage until at least one o'clock. They start late and everyone talks a little too much. Anyway, I got into a little dispute with Jimmy about what time the car should pick us up. Uh, he announced he was leaving without me. Oh. So uh, we got there eh, 1120 and they were like setting up chairs, you know, but we hung out for a while, probably talked to John Stewart and um, God, I'll try to think of uh, Debbie Liebling. Um, her dad, by the way, AJ Liebling. Wrote a very famous book called The Sweet Science, oh, the most uh, famous boxing. boxing book ever. Uh, the, 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 the one that everyone refers to. When you're boxing, wow. you got to read this, this book. Or anyone fan of boxing must read this book. But uh, he wrote uh, The Sweet Science. I think that was her dad. Anyway, she Is was she a, from Comedy Central? Yeah. She's a nice blonde-haired lady who was sweet and kind of like a Jewish mom. And then we were trying to do... We were trying to do the the man show, you know. Right. And uh, she liked me. I mean, I think Jimmy and Danny were a little bit of a hothead. And so they put me on the phone with her as a good cop right. to try to talk through yeah. these dis- disgusting things we try to do. And um, he's the lead guest. <laughs> she would. Uh, she got us backstage and she said, uh you guys are really likable guys. Like you're both, I know you both well, you're friendly, you're likable. Um, you're nothing like the man show characters that the you persona. portray. Right. right. Mm-hmm. So just do me a favor. <laughs> just go out there and just be the likable yeah. version of you that I know. Yeah. And I said, okay. Not a lot to ask. And we went out there. And we probably said a couple of words, and then we a said, of Ziggy and Zombie. <laughs> we'll open it up to the, the press. And the very first question, <clears throat> the very first question was somebody raised their hand, angry woman, and she said, uh, you have the Juggy Dance Squad. What if you had the Darky Dance Squad? It was all black women. How would that work? And Jimmy's like, sit down, Dumbo. <laughs> And I said, uh, when we start a retarded dance squad, we'll give you a call. And Debbie Lieber, like Debbie. broke her pencil like backstage. <laughs> like, shit. That's the other uh, cutaway. She throws uh, papers in the air and turns around. That's what I remember. And then I remember at the end that that afternoon, they had the whole lawn in the back of the Four Seasons or the whatever it was, all done up with like a arcade just to show you what kind of money they would throw at everything they had the ferris wheel and oh the oh, wow. sledgehammer to test your strength like you know these like, booths set up yeah, yeah it's like the end of greece that all set up yeah. back there and all the reporters were just there and i had this reporter i think he was from minnesota he's like middle-aged guy and he walked he was standing there and we're just talking on the lawn he had his little pad out mm. you know like a reporter and, you know yeah scoop and he was saying, uh, so what do you think, uh, what, uh, what, what do we have in mind for season two? Or what can we look forward to? Or something. He was just doing a story. And that super angry woman who asked the question from inside just walked past us in a huff. And she said, I want you to know you probably have a small dick. And she just like blasted past oh. us. <laughs> and the guy, I'll never forget this. He, he goes, he doesn't even look up. He's just writing. He goes, oh, that's good unbiased journalism. <laughs> what he said while he was writing it made me fucking laugh I like my ass him. off yeah I like that guy do you guy. remember what outlet he was from somewhere in Minnesota oh, as right. I Tiny Dick Weekly as, as, as I recall <laughs> yeah so um, but I've done a million of those upfronts, and they were fun 
kind of. They'd fly you out to New York all the time. Yeah. They'd have these big, it was like everything was big. It was yeah. for advertisers, big, right? Big things, yeah. yeah. And they'd have these. Or affiliates or whatever. Yeah, what was the one? Remember uh, Max Zapata, the picture of uh, Sir, uh, what's his name, Max looking at looking at me. Um, God, oh, ben, Kingsley. Ben, Kingsley. ben Kingsley. Oh, Remember yeah. that picture? Yeah, that was backstage at one of those crazy, <laughs> crazy upfronts. You're right. Like, those days are over. Yes. Ben God, Kingsley. he's so scared of you. <laughs> and sitting in such judgment. Well, you know the story behind that. He was just, Ben Kingsley was just sitting alone backstage. They, they, they'd have, there was all this backstage area, but they didn't really have dressing rooms. They'd just have a big curtain because they'd have it at a huge cathedral or something or some, oh, a bank, like, but mm. from 1907, right. you know, with right. 40 foot ceilings or whatever. And Ben Kingsley was just sitting there alone and everyone's just like eating snacks and looking at him and eating snacks. And he was just sitting there all by himself, like the whole time. And I'm like, I'm going to go talk to him. So lucky Ben. I walked up to him and I said, Ben, you do movies, but you've probably never been on stage before. So you're probably pretty nervous right now about going out there because you're I work in front of a live audience. That's my thing. I have stage experience. You you do movies right. and things like that, but you don't work in front of an audience. Right. And it's a different animal. It's a different rhythm. You've probably never been there. So let me just put you at ease. Let me give you a couple pointers about, you know, getting up on stage and performing. Because this is a different right. this is a different venue yeah. for you. <laughs> he just stared at me like that the whole fucking God time. God damn, he looks so <laughs> pissed. Like so yeah. over it. Yeah, no, was, he's dead, Penny. You know? I was describing what it was like to be on stage. Because <laughs> you, it's him. funny because you look serious too. I'm laying not, up. Like, walk I up. went in there with a straight face, and I was like, <laughs> "I'm going to tell Ben Kingsley what it's like to be on a stage in That's front of fantastic. people." Fantastic. Yeah. Well done. Well, here are a couple of the jokes that that uh, Jimmy told at the upfronts, and again, there was a ton. These were just a couple that I thought were pretty funny. He says. We're here to tell you what our plan is to avoid extinction. More people contracted blood clots from the Johnson & Johnson vaccine than are currently watching network TV. <laughs> here at ABC, we have two kinds of shows, canceled and I didn't know that was still on. <laughs> the good news is we have some very funny new shows. The bad news is they're all dramas. And <laughs> CBS, is, good. CBS is once again <laughs> calling right. themselves the most watched network. Being the most watched network is like being the best selling fax machine. <laughs> so he just ripped them the whole time. That is funny. Yeah, I can I can remember being there and like something like this would go down and be like, Jimmy's got to do the upfronts <laughs> in three weeks, riders. We got to start. Mm -hmm. We got to start cranking it out. Yeah, Jimmy was masterful at taking the stuff, sculpting the stuff. It's really all these things we talked about in the past, like producing the Kevin and Bean. Christmas album right. every year and doing all the dingo boys and doing all the other bits we would do. Like he was learning how to assemble things, mm -hmm. put things together, yeah. work with this writer, work with this talent. Mm -hmm. Like it was all, all these things that nobody wants to do because it's for free. Like I don't mm -hmm. do that. I, it's not part of my job doing the Served Christmas album. Well. It's not, yeah, you build up these muscles yep. and these skills, yes. Speaking of that, I don't know if you, I'm sure Brian hasn't because he doesn't watch TV, but uh, I started watching, I think there's been two episodes of that new show on HBO, Hacks. I love it. Are you serious? No. You didn't know. It's it's a it's a fun premise. It made me think of you. Do you know anything about it, Adam? You should have thought of me because that was my longest running love line joke that Dr. Drew never <laughs> laughed at. Oh, Hack? The, the, yeah, Hack. Yeah, yeah. There's that Different that, show, but yeah. <laughs> He was a cab driver who's like solved crime. Oh, right. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. And I was go this week on Hack, in order to bust an international jewel thief, Hack must become a rapist. <laughs> <laughs> and Drew would go. And I, each time I would do it with yeah, the more exotic right. thing, but it would always end up with a rapist. rapist. And uh, Drew was always like, that's not funny. <laughs> I mean, like, it makes me laugh. It is pretty funny, but this is um, this is Jean Smart. She plays this Vegas 
Yeah, she mm-hmm. plays a rapist. She's like this, like kind of aging out, kind of getting washed up, big Vegas comic, mm-hmm. and her sales are sinking, and nobody really wants to, uh, you know, keep her around the, you know, win or wherever she is. And then this, it's it's very of the moment. This young lesbian writer chick who got in trouble and got canceled for tweeting a joke. Mm-hmm. Ha- no one will hire her, mm. and so they kind of get matched together to sort of revamp her act, and it's it's fun. Hmm. Now, I, I used to watch I'm Dying Up Here and that was enjoyed a great that. Show. This is very different. And uh, I enjoyed, um, oh, God, what's the other stand-up show I like so much? You guys series? Be, yeah. There was one on Showtime. You're going to be angry when yeah. Crashing. Crashing. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Up that, love that. So maybe yeah. I'll watch this. Yeah, it's, it's I, I mean, it'll it'll find its legs. There's only been two episodes, but uh, I, I enjoyed it. I'm, I'm looking forward to more. All right, let me tell you about uh, Hyundai Tucson. Ah, that's right. Hyundai questioned everything to create the best Tucson ever. Every inch of the all-new Tucson has been completely reimagined, resulting in an SUV loaded with innovations inside and out. From design to technology to safety, every aspect of the new Tucson has been improved and completely redesigned. I am telling you people... This is so much car for the money. I was so impressed when I got a real close look at this thing and I sat in it for a while. I used the uh, 10 and a quarter inch full touch infotainment screen, by the way. It's got LED daytime running lights. They're stylishly hidden behind the grill. The digital key allows you to use your phone as a spare key. Tons of technology, tons of safety, and a ton of car, especially for the price. Learn more, Hyundai. Dot com. That's Hyundai.com. All right, Gina, let's do one more. All right. So let's talk a little Kim Kardashian. She's in the news for a new reason. She did some shopping over the weekend and mm-hmm. for Janet Jackson's birthday. She bought herself something. Uh, Kim spent $25,000 on the two-piece outfit Janet wore in the 1993 If music video. I think we have that and maybe oh. a clip of the she video. You can buy James remember. Dean's transaxle. What's up with that bitch? I know. The custom top and pants were uh, up for bid at Julian's auction, and Kim was the top bidder. She said, for Janet Jackson's birthday, because I'm such a fan, I can't believe I won this outfit. Uh, Janet responded on her Instagram story thanking her, and she says, I hope If gets you as much pleasure as it did me. Again, $25,000 for something that'll it's funny. You want, sit on you, a mannequin. You want it for twenty five grand. It's like donating an egg for twenty five <laughs> right. grand. Like, That's right. Uh, I don't know if it's a proper use of one or donate. <laughs> All right, let's bring it home, Gina Grad. You got it. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. I want you to know you probably have a small dick. Gina, Gina Grad. That was the news with Gina Grad. Well, the great Andrew McCarthy uh-huh. from so many films. Also My done a lot of pat. directing as well. But uh, I have watched a shit out of Andrew McCarthy over the years. Pretty in pink, saying almost fired. Less than zero. Less than zero could be the 80th yes. of all 80s. Robert Downey Jr. 80s Bernie's movies. So we'll do a one-on-one uh, with Andrew right after this. Do you want to be a part of Adam's next book? No! Submit your questions for Ask an Asshole by emailing them to askhole at adamcarolla.com. Ask about any topic you need the Ace Man's advice or answers on. That's A-S-K-H-O-L-E at adamcarolla.com. Andrew McCarthy has joined me. He's got a new book out, a memoir called Brat. An 80s story. It's a revealing look at Andrew's coming-of-age story dealing with innocence, addiction, and masculinity. And here he is to talk about it. Good to see you, Andrew. You too. I'm a fan. I grew up watching uh, all your movies and uh, always had a a mild obsession with you. (laughs) Really? Okay. (laughs) Do tell. I don't know. I guess I've, I've probably seen St. Elmo's Fire 145 times. and Really? I, and I was the guy you identified with? Yeah, it was weird. I don't, I, I don't even know if I identified with you. I just, I just sort of found myself studying your, your character a lot. But also, um, less than zero, I felt that the same way about, which I announced is like the 80th of all 80s movies. Would you agree? I would. I mean, that movie is sort of like the, it, it, it's, 
if the eighties were a party, that's the two thirty in the morning kind of it's grinding down and we're just kind of taking another hit to try and keep it going when we know the party's over kind of movie. I also have a, a little bit of a connection because the Ringwald family grew up up the street from me in North Hollywood. No way. Yeah. I, I had a big crush on uh, Molly's older sister, Beth. And uh, <laughs> when I met Molly, she was 10 or something like there was no, they lived in a little itty bitty house in North Hollywood and uh, dad played the piano and it was like a, funky little family mom baked all day it was a it had nothing to do with celebrity at all funny yeah she can't her father's a musician yeah that's right yeah yeah bob plays uh dixieland oh um, does he you live above a dixieland uh, bar but that's another story you what <laughs> i lived above a bar that played dixieland when yeah, back, day. Uh, back right around that time 80 well no right before we get a bridge around 87 or so 88 so what? And, it, yeah, let's talk about uh, your story. How does it? How does it begin? Oh, that's how far back you want to go. <laughs> well, I know something. I know. I know you went to NYU for a couple of years, and we're kind yeah, of asked to leave. Yeah, I went to NYU for to study acting, and uh, I was kicked out after a couple of years, and then um, I, pretty soon, right right after I was kicked out, a few weeks, some a friend of mine called me up and um, said. Look, they're casting a movie looking for someone 18, vulnerable and sensitive. And I was like, dude, that's me. So I went up to the audition when there were 500 other 18, vulnerable and sensitive kids. And uh, I went to another audition and just kept going back and back. And finally, they cast me as the lead in this movie with, you know, that, then I had to fly out and meet Jacqueline Bissett. I was to play Jacqueline Bissett's young lover in a movie called Class. And so I had to fly out to meet her and get approved by her and whatnot. And then with then Rob was, Lowe, right? Rob, yeah, Rob Lowe. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I, w I watched the shit out of all those movies back back in the day. So you had so that was a major movie as your first movie, right? I mean, that that was a you know it wasn't Gone with the Wind, but it was a major theatrical release. It was in yeah, all the I mean, theaters. it was a, it was a real movie back then. You know, it wasn't successful particularly, and it wasn't well reviewed at all. But it was a real movie, yeah, for sure. And you got yeah. that straight out of leaving NYU? Yeah, I mean, I'd been studying college. And so I got it right out of studying acting in college. And I got it right out of, yeah, right after they kicked me out. And uh, and then I was in the movies. And then I didn't work again for a year. So, you know, my next job was uh, being the, the Pepsi boy in a Burger King commercial with Elizabeth Shue. <laughs> And uh, which is still visible to this day on YouTube. None of all our past mistakes and come back to haunt us on YouTube. And uh, then I did a movie called uh, Catholic Boys or Heaven Help Us. It was retitled Heaven Help Us. And then came Sin on Was Fire and then my career kind of happened. Was Heaven Help Us Sean Penn? Or no. Am I confused? It, no, that, it's a movie about Catholic uh, boys school in Brooklyn in New York in the 1960s. It was a really good movie. It's probably the best movie I did in the 80s with Donald Sutherland's in it and John Hurd and uh, it was a, and Mary Stuart Masterson was a girl. And it, was, it was a good movie. Um, so for you, you're, you're out. Why'd they kick you out of NYU film school or acting well, school? In the theater program. Well, I, I, I didn't go. <laughs> I was in three days a week. I did acting stuff, which I was interested in, went to. And then two days a week, I had academic classes, which I just never bothered to go to. So that was that. Was a, uh... But you're a good enough student in high school academically to get to I NYU. Not, I was not a good student in high school academically at all. Um, I just used to smoke a lot of pot and did, had no interest in Back then, NYU was not an, a difficult school to get into. And I got into it for the theater program. So it was just I auditioned and got in. It was the only school I got into. So I went there. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't sort of it's become this kind of elite school somehow. But it, it certainly wasn't in 1980. Well, yeah, it is funny because you talk to a lot of people that are talented, but don't seem like very good students like Adam Sandler and a lot of other like young comedians or now middle aged comedians. And they go, oh, we met at NYU. And I'm like, how the hell did you pass the SATs? But <laughs> you at some point, uh, addiction comes into your life. Yeah, yeah, I was uh all during that time, I, I was, you know, I guess when I I started drinking at the normal drinking age of about 
12, <laughs> but it started to take over my, uh, become a dominant force in my life in my twenties, all the time I was making those, uh, uh, those Brat Pack movies. Yeah. It was sort of exist. I mean, I always say that I didn't drink because I was in those movies. People always say, Oh, you were successful too soon. So you drank. And I'm like, no, I drank because I really loved vodka and I had an affinity for drinking. <laughs> and that's, I was able to drink better vodka because I was in the movies, but no, I drank because it was my, it was like a primary thing. It wasn't a reaction to anything else. So yeah, all through the eighties, uh, I, and it started to get in the way of my work late eighties, I'd say till then it was the first half of the eighties. It was not a factor really. It sort of gave me a certain Dutch courage and sort of, persona a bit but later on the way it always does it sort of turns in on you at that invisible point when you don't know it and uh and it had a you know detrimental effect it took me several years to realize i had a problem then several years to do something about it uh how long have you been sober she in 92 wow you and uh trying to think the guys who've been sober the longest bobcat goldthwaite I think he got sober when he was like 18 or something like that. I'm, I'm yeah, always 29. Hmm? Yeah. You were 29. I was 29. Yeah. Um, but you know, lucky in that I was totally played out. It wasn't like I was drinking and I could have pretended that it, it wasn't an issue. It was just such a dominant force in my life at that point that like very little else could go on at that point. So I couldn't pretend that it was, you know, something I could handle or something. It just took over my life. The um, I'm sure there's plenty of, Brad Pack uh, talk in in the book. Do you can you tell us some of those stories, affairs, fights, fun fun <laughs> tidbits? Whole, what's the last bit you said there? Fun <laughs> tidbits, anecdotes. Fun tidbits. <laughs> well, the most Brad Packy story that I know is um, <clears throat> the night when Rob Lowe and we were doing Saint Elmo's Fire, and Rob invited me to go out to dinner with him and his girlfriend and. Uh, who was Melissa Gilbert at the time, the actress on Little House on the Prairie, and said, we're going to Spago, dude, you want to come? And Spago was, as you probably know, this sort of the premier eatery in Los Angeles at that time, you know, it was like Wolfgang Puck's first restaurant, yeah. I think. Anyway, it was just this hot spot. And so I went and my dinner, the other person at dinner was Liza Minnelli. And I was like, oh, hi, hi, Liza. Yeah, I'll have a double vodka, please. And then at the end of the evening, Liza kind of said, hey, what do you say we all go to Sammy's? which I'm now, you know, half of the bag. And I, I said, yeah, Sammy's love to, love to go to Sammy's. I, I thought Sammy's was like a club or Studio 54 or something on the West Coast. And so I, sure, we, let's go to Sammy's. And so we all pile in the car and sort of head up into the hills. And we suddenly feel like we are not uh, going to some club. We're at somebody's house. And then we knock on the door and the door swings open and there's Sammy Davis Jr. going, hey, cats, come on in. I'm having a little bash, join the party. And we hung out at Sammy Davis Jr.'s house and uh, joined the party. And it was kind of this crazy, weird, show busy Hollywood night. It was kind of great. Kind of, I mean, Sammy was fantastic to us, you know, he was with me just smoking away and I'm smoking, he's smoking and he's making me drinks. And it's like, I got my eye on you. I got my good eye on you and I'm loving what you're doing. Keep it up. And I'm like, thanks, Sammy. <laughs> Can I have another vodka? <laughs> I, I wonder if those days, I mean, I know there's Hollywood parties now, but I don't think there's those Hollywood parties now. Certainly not where everyone's smoking. Party I mean, it was, <laughs> it was, it was a different time for sure. And it was still when that kind of old Hollywood still existed, you know, around the periphery and they were very uh, kind of welcoming to us in, you know, in a way that there was no kind of resentment. Like who do you young punks think you are? It was just like, yeah, join the club, man. Come on in the family. It was, which was kind of wondrous and great and exciting. And on one hand and on the other hand, it seemed utterly mundane and normal and like they're just people and you're just sort of having a drink at Sammy's house. <laughs> but no matter what, it's still Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, I always say the best era was pre-AIDS, mid-Coke. So AIDS didn't, <laughs> AIDS didn't exist and Coke was kind of good for you or certainly wasn't bad for you back then. And it must have been a fun time to have a party. I remember when someone said to me when I was, I was first shown Coke, cocaine and someone said, it's like the perfect drug. It has no consequences. Mm -hmm. said, really? Okay. Give me some, <laughs> you know, and that is what people kind of, I don't know what that was sort of the, the word on the street at the mo that moment. And it was just right around then. It was a little early. That would be early eighties, like very early, late seventies, really that. 
But Coke wasn't your weapon of choice. It was Coke vodka. Not mine. It if was you vodka. had it, I did it. If you had it, I did it because it helped me drink more. But no, I, I drank because I drank. Yeah. Um, do you um, and how how was your? I think your. Oh, I'm trying to think what your parents did. Somebody told me banker. My mother worked in uh, a- advertising at a, at a magazine, and my dad sold insurance. And then later, he structured tax shelters and some kind of vague business dealings. How were they with your incredible? Brad Pack fame. You know, how were, my dad had a hard time because uh, his fortunes were sort of crashing as mine were ascending. So he had a difficult time with that. And and uh, that's in the book a bit. I talk a lot about that because it was such a dominant force of, you know, there were three things that happened to me in the 80s. One was I was in the movies and became successful. One was I drank a lot. The third was I had a, a very conflicted, difficult relationship with my father. And they're all sort of intertwined, you know? And when I started making money, my father started needing money desperately. And so it turned into a whole dynamic that was pretty unfortunate. So my mom was always like, oh, that's wonderful, dear. I'm glad you're doing what you want to do. But my dad had a difficult time with it. Are you, were your parents together at the time? No, they split up. Uh, just as I went to college, they'd, they'd split up. So um, my dad, you know, he was having a tough time. Was it weird being kind of grouped in like like the Brat Pack? Like we had decided collectively as a society that this group of actors must be put together or must be labeled something. And we don't really do that anymore. I don't I don't feel like I just feel like this guy. I mean, it's sort of the antithesis of being an actor, not really being an individual in the sense that you get labeled as a as a group. And that's a really good point. I never heard it put like that. It is exactly the antithesis of what you want as a, as an actor. Particularly, you don't want to be called a brat. You don't want to be, called, <laughs> right. you don't want to be labeled anything because the minute you're labeled anything, people stop examining it, and that's it's just what that is. You're that, and that's the end of it. The other conversation's over about you, and that is not helpful to an actor. Certainly, it's not helpful to a human. And although we all do it, and it certainly wasn't helpful when I I. Uh, so I recoiled from the phrase at first. I thought it was awful. And it was a very pejorative kind of negative term in the media and in sort of around show business. It was very kind of stigmatizing. I think the public always kind of thought of it as this kind of cool, affectionate term, like we were the ultimate in-group. And they, you know, aspired to that. It took me a long time to kind of come around to their way of thinking that it was a positive thing and not this negative uh, thing to be saddled with. Uh, but I certainly didn't appreciate it when it happened. I mean, it came from this magazine article that was really, you know, quite a nasty article. So it, so for you, do you feel, and by the way, I should just tell the listeners because I'm kind of looking down the uh, list here. Emilio Estevez was a Brad Packer, though I never, I thought of him sort of half a Brad Packer. Anthony Michael <laughs> Hall, Rob Lowe was squarely in there. Demi Moore, Judd Nelson, of course, uh, Molly Ringwald. Ali Sheedy. Um, do you feel then like you almost got stereotyped from that, from that era, from those people, from that title, from that label? For a long time. Sure. I don't know if stereotyped is the word so much, because, but certainly, you know, branded and that's what you were, you know, and that's what we were in, you know, and so it, it preceded anything I did. If I walked in, it was my introduction to you, you know, Right. And so, yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't care for it. You know, I, th- I just thought it was, like I said, negative and sort of pejorative and, and kind of nasty. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. That's not, and I, what I didn't like about it, it just felt like I wasn't seen, you know? Right. And then, but again, you know, the, like the public was having a different response to that. And, you know, I could have made the same movies in the eighties that I made. And if the Brad Pack term didn't exist, we probably wouldn't be talking now. Because it it came over time certainly to represent this like this era in pop culture and become this iconically affectionate phrase that it has now become. But it also is sort of like a you know a soup that all the different it's more than the sum of its ingredients in a certain way. So the brat pack has come to mean this thing, and the brat pack now, to my estimation, from what I've gleaned over all these decades, but is that it's sort of like it's not so much the movies anymore; it's the people. Recall when you say Brat Pack to a certain generation of person, it's them recalling their youth 
Mm-hmm. It's not even calling me in movies or the movies themselves. It's recalling them when, where they were when those movies were happening. And all those people were at that moment in life when they were just cusping and stepping out into the world and just sort of their future was like this blank slate to be written on. And that's a thrilling, exciting time in life, you know? And that's what I have come over the years to. I've become like this avatar of people's youth in a certain hmm. way. I could remember, and by the way, I was at the Pretty in Pink premiere uh, back in mid to later 80s, I don't know, 85, 86. I'm trying to, yeah. trying to think. But I did you go to the Pretty in Pink premiere out here in Los Angeles? I did at the China, Man Chinese. Yeah, I did. Man's Chinese. And when I walked out and it started, when the, when the credits rolled, I, I got up and left. <laughs> oh, you did? I did. I walked across the street to Hamburger Hamlet and got drunk. <laughs> Did you uh, did you go to the after party? Yeah, I did at the palace. At the palace. To, yeah, I was there. Are you sure. I'm I'm so glad you confirmed that because uh, I was friendly enough with Molly and the Ringwalds to to go to that palace after party after Pretty in Pink. I uh, here's a detail from that night that uh, I'll never forget. Quite a few actually, but. Molly had had her wisdom her teeth pulled. Yeah. I'm yeah. so glad someone can substantiate this story. She had her wisdom teeth pulled like the day before. Dude, that's the first line of my book is Molly was there, but her te- wisdom teeth had been pulled. It's the first line of the book. Really? <laughs> yeah. Well, don't expect to go on, on anyone else's podcast and have that story <laughs> substantiated because she sat right behind me at the, at the Grauman's Chinese theater. And I remember looking at her face and it was all chipmunky, like it was all swollen. And I remember thinking, this is your movie premiere. Why didn't you get the wisdom teeth pulled on the Next following week. Friday? Yeah. I could never figure that. She had probably had too much cotton in her mouth to answer me clearly. But I do remember going to the palace and going to the after party and getting shit faced on vodka I, I didn't really have a drinking problem, but my thing back then was free booze. I'm going to drink <laughs> enough for, for 10 people. Yeah. And I was, uh, there's, there's a, there's footage of that that exists again on YouTube of, how do I say? Faye, Faye, the guy the lead singer from the tubes. Uh, yes. Phoebe Weibel or something yeah. like this. And, and Phoebe or something. Wade yes. Weibel or something. Yeah. Phoebe Weibel. Phoebe right. Weibel. The, the tubes. Yeah. Yeah, he was interviewing people for MTV and he got me on on camera interviewing me and I'm just smoking and I'm just clearly just so drunk. It's like, you can't imagine how a publicist in this day and age, they would just never let that happen. First they'd grab the cigarette and then they'd see me sort of swag and they go, oh, you're not going to go talking on TV now. Was that you out know? front of the palace? That was inside in the, during the party with the sort of, you know, the lights flashing and that 80s kind of smoke filling the place. And yeah. God, I've never, it's, it's funny. I've always... I talked about this story because I had my own sort of alcohol induced situation that night as well. Um, (laughs) I had, uh, I had built up this sort of hot rod Z car, uh, always was into cars, never had any money, but this was just a big, loud sort of just a, just a loud race car that I'd built in my apartment garage. And uh, I was there with a friend of mine and uh, I had, I had labeled him the designated driver for the night. And I was just drinking my ass off because free booze and, uh, and, and he's my designated driver. And uh, another detail you may recall from that night is it started raining really hard at a certain point. You may have been in the bag by then. Yeah, that, that you've got me there. It started pouring and I was the last guy left at the palace because I was, <laughs> I was looking for my friend. My friend had hooked up with a chick and left, never said a word to me. And I found myself, it's a big place with like multiple stories and levels. I found myself walking around everywhere, looking for my buddy who was going to drive me home. And I was completely obliterated. And at some point it was clear it was time to leave. I was the last one there and I staggered out and it was driving rain. And I walked up the hill cause it was like on Franklin or something. There's that hill that was behind yeah. it. And I had parked my car in like a bank parking lot at the top of the hill. 
and it was a driving rainstorm. And I walked up there and I saw my car parked in the parking lot. And the only other car in the parking lot was an LAPD cruiser parked directly next to my car with no context at all. Just windows were like fogged up. Couldn't see if anyone was in there. Lights off. Only two cars in the parking lot. I had no umbrella or anything. I was just standing in a rainstorm staring at this car. And I didn't know what to do. So I just got into my car, but I just sat there. I was I was too scared to fire it up because I thought as soon as I fired it up, the cops are going to hit the rollers and they were waiting for me. And I just sat in there for an hour doing nothing, scared to death. And eventually I just started it up, drove home and uh, threw up in the bathtub that <laughs> night. That's. But I'm glad you remember that Molly Ringwald had her wisdom teeth removed uh, a couple days earlier. Oh, we have uh, I think we have a we have that clip with fee from the from the two oh, no yeah there it is and and you and oh is that and spader there james spader there yeah oh my god can we play that no please those don't those are <laughs> just two of the guys chasing molly and pretty in pink and to put it simply one's the good guy and one's not so good guy and i'm here with both of them now andrew mccarthy and james spader uh james is the not so good guy was well, it fun about that. well i thought you were Right. Was it fun pa- playing the bad guy? It's always fun playing the bad guy. I, I really hated you in the you know, film. I mean, I loved me? your acting, but <laughs> you convinced me, and There's I a really drink thought that you could pour all over oh. me if you wanted. You just, you just. All right, I won't torture. Uh, I won't torture Andrew <laughs> anymore. That's insane. You get the idea, though. <laughs> it, it's insane that that exists, and it's also insane. That at that very moment, I was wandering around that same place drinking a Greyhound, getting getting shit-faced. I also remember that Barbara Bach, Daisy Duke from the Dukes of Hazard, was there. That's big all. night. It was a big night. <laughs> it was a big that damn night. Called Dara Lab. Dry skin, acne scars, wrinkles, or just want healthier skin. This is the product I use, The Good by Caldera Lab. Non-toxic natural serum made from 100% uh, plants. Named by GQ, the best natural face serum for men for all guys and all skin types. Great with a beard, great with a bald head, or you try it on your scalp as well. Keeps uh, it shiny and moisturized. Caldera Lab. Believes you shouldn't have to decide between clean, sustainable ingredients and real results. Simply apply to dry skin. And uh, Bob's your uncle. This stuff works like magic. Try it. 100% risk-free. If you don't love it, they'll refund you in full. Right, Dawson? Special offer for the Adam Carolla Show audience. 20% off your first Caldera Lab purchase of the good. Go to calderalab.com slash Adam. That's C A R. C-A-L-D-E-R-A-L-A-B dot com. Or use discount code Corolla. Um, or use discount code Adam at checkout. All right, we'll take a quick break. Back to talk a little more to Andrew McCarthy right after this. Back with Andrew McCarthy. Brat, an 80 story. It's available now on Amazon. I am uh, so glad we stumbled into this pretty and pink thing. Um, also... I'm from North Hollywood. I'm from the San Fernando Valley. So I used to just watch St. Elmo's Fire and go, what is this life over here where you have like brick buildings with ivy on the side of them and seasons and like it it all seemed bizarre to me coming from North Hollywood. Uh, Any recollections from St. Elmo's Fire? Well, I mean, we shot most of that at the on the back lot in North Hollywood. Oh. We, were weeks, we were only a couple of weeks in uh, in DC. Oh, most really? of like the bar and everything were all built on the soundstage. Yeah. Did you film that at Radford Studios out here? No, we filmed it at uh, at Warner Brothers. Oh man! So <laughs> you filmed that thing like four miles from where I was living, wondering yeah. what this crazy land would would be like to live in. Yeah, I mean, that was a great, that was a lot of fun most of the time, that movie. You know, I, I, I for me, I just felt like I was, for the first time, ready to go. You know, I felt like I knew I was the right guy in the right part at the right time. And I knew, you know, and I knew it. And I had, and I had a ball. 
and I knew where I fit in that group, sort of just off to the side of it and sort of had my little opportunities to chime in and score. And I, I, I really enjoyed that movie. Uh, I know you're doing uh, directing now, uh, Orange is the New Black and Blacklist and Gossip Girl, amongst others. Um, is that how much acting versus directing versus writing are, where, are you into now? Well, I mean, my day job for the last 10 years has been, uh, been well, it was travel writing for a while there. And then uh, in the last decade, mostly I have been uh, directing television which, you know, which I, which I enjoy doing, you know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting job. And uh, at the end of the day, I think it's ultimately very much a job, but uh, as opposed to a vocation, you know, directing television, but, uh, but I like it, you know, I, I have all the actor neuroses that there are. So I understand all that about the actors. So I, I, I enjoy the television directing. Although I've, I started acting again recently, just in some shows that I direct and uh, I, I do this show called Good Girls sometimes, and I'm acting a bit on that, which is really fun to, I, I'm surprised how much I've enjoyed sort of acting again. I hadn't done it in a number of years. And to sort of be able to just sort of step in and do it without the anxiety it used to cause me was, uh, I, I like it a lot, you know. We kind of just skim past the travel and the writing, and I, I know you're an editor at large at National Geographic um, Travel Magazine. Can we talk a little about that? Yeah, I mean, that sort of saved my life. I got into that about, you know, early, about 16, 17 years ago. I started travel writing sort of accidentally. And um, then it, right as my acting sort of was fizzling in, inside me, I, it wasn't that I'd lost a lot of interest in it and wasn't doing the kind of things that I would, would really want to be doing. So I, it was sort of a reinvigoration of my sort of creative life, for lack of a better word. And I, uh, yeah, so I've just been travel writing and, and which is a great job. And I mean, it's certainly downwardly mobile from in the movies, but it was, it was a lot of, it's been a lot of fun and it's, uh, I love it. I'm a big believer in travel. I think travel changes people and changes people's lives. I'm not talking about vacations particularly, but I'm talking about, you know, there's that Mark Twain line, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry and narrow mindedness, you know, and I think that's true. I, I think travel just trend, changes people. So anyway, I, I got into that and then I stumbled into uh, directing and then that sort of took off and, uh, well, travel writing is a great thing. It doesn't put three kids through private school. So <laughs> the, the television directing is sort of taken well, on its own. Well, you know, the thing about, I had this sort of bizarre thought about travel as I was driving in to work today. Because I know the kind of travel you're talking about is a little more interesting and probably more exotic. But I was just thinking as I was driving in, just behind a bunch of cars on the freeway, I went all the towns I've been in and all the shows I've done all over the country, I was just sort of thinking about all the places I've been just here in this country, just mostly doing shows. And I just thought right now someone's sitting in that town and they're behind some car and they're basically having the same experience I'm having here. But when you're here and you never leave here, you don't really know that exists. You don't know. I mean, you understand intellectually people are somewhere and they have a house and they have a car and they have a commute and they have work or whatever. And when you start getting into an international way, and I think this is kind of what you're speaking to, it kind of opens you up. You realize all this stuff is going on all day, every day. And you're kind of pretending like it's only going on within a 10 foot radius of you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that's really true. And I think that's a, to be able to sit in your car and kind of go, oh, that guy in Kansas, he's probably doing the same thing. Um, to be able to do that and actually put, own that on experiential levels, that changes who you are. And that, that's a better person than somebody who's never left L.A. and is sitting there with only that perspective on the world. You know what I mean? And that's made you, you know, that adds a lot to who you are as a human, you know, and even just observing it on that sort of level. You know, I, I look in, in places in the world and I go, oh, my God, they're still doing that. I bet they're still doing that kind of right, chasing that elephant thing like every day. It wasn't just the day I was there. They do that. So they do every day. Right. While I'm doing my mundane life. And it's, it's nice to know the world's out there happening. You know, and most of the world is very different than we've been told to fear a lot of the world and all that. And it's just not the case. Not my experience anyway. Uh, you stay in touch uh, with any of the uh, old cohorts? You know, I, I didn't for a number of years. And then, you know, as I've grown to sort of embrace the old brat back, uh, I was on 
I talked to Rob Lowe last week. I hadn't talked to Rob in a decade. And we, I, you know, I was doing his podcast actually. And then it was great to talk to him. It was great. It was sort of, you know, we're getting so old that there's something about those moments of youth. And, you know, we shared a group of us shared something that very few people shared. And so to sort of connect over that's kind of cool. And, you know, I, I see Molly and talk to Molly not infrequently because she's here in New York. And, uh, I was just texting with John Pryor the other day. So, I mean, I, I, I do somewhat, yeah. And I, I think I'm much more affectionate toward the whole idea of it than I used to be for years. Yeah, I mean, I think it works that way in many facets of show business and then beyond where you sort of, you get saddled with some sort of label, you fight against it, then you reject it, maybe pretend it didn't exist for some time. And then at some point, you get a little time, a little perspective, and you realize that you're kind of proud of it. Like that's an accomplishment. That's pretty. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly my experience. Exactly my experience. And then just sort of owning it and realizing it actually meant a lot to certain people. And they like want people come up to him for a long time. People come up to me and I was always like, Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And go away. Um, and to finally go be able to just sort of embrace that and let them, they want to share with me that it meant something to them. And to be able to receive that was a kind of a maturity or something that I didn't particularly have or an openness that I wasn't willing to have. And as I've started to become more willing to do that, that's made my life richer, you know, and that took me a while to do. And like that, those movies meant something to people. And that's cool. John know? Cryer used to be my neighbor when I lived in Hollywood land. Dude, you have a pretty and pink six degrees like going on. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and uh, he lived right across the street with his then wife, a pretty blonde, but I don't think it. I don't think it lasted. I don't think it lasted very long. Um, and Rob, Rob did my podcast about a year ago, and I, I just found him. I just find find that guy to be a great spirit, Rob Lowe. Yeah, Rob's fantastic. You know, he somehow, he just, he stays in the place of delight, you know, and he's, he's, you know, he's sneaky smart and he just stays in a really kind of good place with it all and skates through in a, in a delightful kind of way, you know, and he always, as a kid, he was that way. And it's it sort of, he settled into it in a, in a great, great way. Do you have thoughts about, like, I always thought, Again, going so far back with uh, Molly Ringwald, and I think she's a real talent. And I, I, th- I feel that way about yourself as well. I feel like there's still some movie or some project or some something out there that would be a, a, a defining prod, pro, you know, a 2.0 version. Like, you know, it's, it's a sort of a Tarantino cast you in a role for his next film or, or something like that. Do you think about that? Do you have aspirations of that? Are you, are you comfortable where you're at now? Or do you think I'm going to write a movie or I'm going to star in this? Like, do you have thoughts about that? Well, I don't live with it on a, uh, you know, I, I think one of the reasons I was able to sort of transform my feelings about the Brad Pack and write the book about it was because I feel so, safely distant from it like i'm okay i'm kind of okay with what's going on in my life now so that i can sort of see that with clarity but there are there are times when i kind of go i wonder if there's one more there you know i i um i haven't missed acting until i just started doing it again like i said and i thought ah, that was there's something you know i'll always be an actor that's what i it's like that joke of like the two fish cast each other in the water and one says hey ain't the water fine today and the other fish says what water Right. I mean, that's, like, that's what I am. So do I think that occasionally? And sometimes I, I think that. I, go, I wonder if there's one more little pop there. Yeah. When you uh, wrote the book, obviously you're telling a lot of old stories from back when that involve a lot of these people we were talking about. Did you have to consider that? Did you have to vet it with them? Did you have to run it by them? Well, I mean, mostly what I was writing was about my sort of internal experience of it. I wasn't sort of telling tales and stuff, but I mean, I did send some stuff Molly was in. I said that to Molly, see if she was okay with that. And Jacqueline Bissett's in the book for an guy, because when I first came to LA, I, after the movie I did with her, I, I went and lived at her house with her. She was, I was her guest at her house for a while. And so I wrote about that fairly extensively. So I 
sent it to her and asked her if she was okay. So I, I'd say I, there were half of it, you know, sent to my mother, see if she was okay. And uh, that was the main one. And then, uh, yeah, there were there were several people I sent things to, because it, it's not that kind of book. I'm not looking to trash anybody. It wasn't, and that wasn't my experience at the time either. I, I was just trying to figure stuff out. And in the book, I was trying to piece together what, what was going on inside me at that time. And so, yes, certain lots of these people were all in it and reflected in it, but it wasn't about them per se. It's not tales about other people particularly. Um, if you went and lived at Jacqueline Bissett's house, you must have had an insane crush on her. Oh my God. I don't think it would be possible to not lust after a 34 year old Jacqueline Bissett, who's one of well, the most she was, beautiful she women ever. Uh, yeah, I was 19. She was 38. She was living with Alexander Gudinov at the time, this Russian ballet star defector. So they were probably the most beautiful couple on the planet. And there was little Andy in the back guest bedroom. And it was just like this crazy time. There'd be these dinner parties and there's, oh, there's Louis Malle and, and Candace Bergen. Okay, yeah, pass the salt, please, Candace. And, you know, and there's Andy. And it was a crazy, wonderful. I mean, they were so kind and welcoming to me. Yeah, but I certainly was smitten. Yeah, for those who want to confirm what we're talking about, you should see the ah, just watch the trailer for the movie The Deep. And I, <laughs> I think you'll understand what we're talking about. We're talking about Jacqueline Bissett, like the height of her powers. So she's an amazing, amazing looking person and had a great accent, right? It's just good. Everything it just all worked, <laughs> you know. And did you you were like staying with them just because you were working well, I, out here in L.A.? Yeah, I, I worked on the movie with Jack and I play her young lover in this movie. And then at the, as the movie's ending, she says, Andrew, what are you doing after the film? And I said, well, I, I got to go to L.A. to get an agent because I didn't have an agent. I just, you know, stumbled in the movie. Like, Oh, that was your first movie. film, right? Yeah. And so she said, where are you staying? And I said, I, I don't know. She goes, well, stay with me. I'm like, uh, OK. <laughs> and so there I was staying in uh, the back bedroom up in uh, up in the hills. And I was there for a while. Jack used to drive me sometimes. I would take the bus to auditions if, um, because I was too young to rent a car. So I'd take a bus, or if Jackie was free, she would drive me to my auditions in her sort of Cadillac convertible. And, you know, she'd wait outside while I went into audition. Where's Jacqueline Bissett now? I, I, I haven't I seen her in a while. In, I think she's still in the same house. Really? Wow. Mm. What a bizarre, what an incredible time. Uh, that was, I should have show business right there, and that was sort of the height of it. I look at uh, thinking of less than zero, but Robert Downey Jr. is such an amazing talent. Did you did you catch that early with him? Well, yeah, I mean, that was sort of a given, but I mean, when we were doing less than zero, I mean, he was, you know, which is all public knowledge, and he was a disaster. He was a mess. He was full-blown into his, you know, crisis. and there was a lot of uh, real life on the screen there in that movie. And so it was, it was kind of terrifying. Certainly. And we were all doing our things, but Bobby was in a league of his own there. Yeah. It's another one of those guys that's just so genuinely nice. He's almost sort he's of, such he's, a lovely guy. It's, you know, even when he was going through all that stuff, everybody would be like, Oh God, I hope he gets it together. Whereas so many times people are just like, you, you, they, they don't feel that way, you know, and for whatever reason, he just, I was a lovely, sweet, sensitive guy. And I, Every nobody's everyone's happy that he came out the other side and became America's favorite superhero. You know, uh, the book it's uh, Brat, an '80s story. It's available now on Amazon, and uh, it's a revealing look at Andrew's coming of age uh, story, dealing with innocence, addiction, and masculinity. Uh, well, if you get out to L.A. You can come stay in my guest house. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm uh, so glad you remember that uh, Pretty in Pink premiere party. But I'm sad that you went across the street to the Hamburger Hamlet and drank during the whole during the whole movie. But but you showed up at the after party, and that's the important part. I don't think I've ever actually sat through the entire movie of it. <laughs> oh, really? 
I don't think so. What is, what are you that way with all your movies, or was it just that yeah, one? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. No, no, pretty much. I mean, that, there were a thousand people there. I was just nervous and scared, and so I just said, "I gotta go." But uh, it's not. I, I like the working part of it. I don't particularly love sitting down and watching them that much. Well, it was good to talk to you, uh, my friend, and I, I hope we'll get to see you here soon. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me, Andrew McCarthy. Everybody. All right, uh, let me tell you about LifeLock. Cyber criminals target job seekers with fake postings designed to trick people into revealing their personal information and social security number. It's important to understand how cybercrime and identity theft are affecting our lives every day. We put our info at risk on the internet in an instant. Cyber criminals could harm your finances, and your credit. Good thing there's LifeLock. LifeLock helps detect a wide range of identity threats like your social security number for sale on the dark web. If they detect your information has potentially been compromised, they'll send you an alert and you'll have access to a dedicated restoration specialist. It's LifeLock. Right, Dawson? No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses, but you can keep what's yours, yours with LifeLock. By Norton. Join now and save up to 25% off your first year by using promo code ADAM. Call 1 800 LifeLock or head to lifelock.com. Use promo code ADAM for 25% off. Hey, Max Badup, let's find more of that Feeb Way Bill. Oh, the whole thing's up on YouTube. It's like an hour long. Really? Yeah, I'll send you the link. <laughs> You're going to want to watch that. I was looking to see if I could even find you in the background. I'm like scrubbing through it. <laughs> so funny. I've been telling that stupid Molly Ringwald uh, wisdom tooth story for 40 years, and everyone just looks at me like, I don't remember that. Yeah. But it's funny that he had a keen, I guess it's in the book. I haven't seen the book yet. Yeah, yeah. Validation must be nice. Validation. Finally, everybody. All right. Uh, Last but not least, 15 seconds for Hyundai Tucson. Every inch of the all-new Tucson has been completely reimagined, resulting in an SUV loaded with innovation. It is a beautiful piece. Go to Hyundai.com. All right, Giannis Pappas is going to join us. Comedian will join us uh, tomorrow. And uh, Jam in the Van this Saturday. Come on out. Everyone's playing, and the whole gang will be there. Go to AdamCarolla.com for all the live shows. And until next time, this is Adam Carolla for Andrew McCarthy, Gina Grad, and Bald Brian saying mahalo. Mahalo.